And then I, I, it, I don't worry about it. And our elders don't worry about it because we know what we're talking about. But I am not a pastor in this church. I am the preaching minister. We have five pastors, elders, shepherds, uh, overseers, bishops in this church. And most of those words we just don't use, but they're Bible words. You say, what's the big deal, Brian? Why does it really matter? It matters because someone will then take from that and say, can a woman be a pastor for a church? What they are meaning by that is, can a woman be a minister in a church? If that's what they mean, I would say yes. We have youth ministers, we have children's ministers, we have small groups ministers. And if you're calling them a pastor, let me just tell you, you're using a world's definition, not the Bible's definition. Now, I can look, jump over that. I told you, down in Alabama, we uh, had an outreach to a, a lot of inner city youth. Uh, um, and they w we would bring them into church. And they just they kind of hung out in the hallway. And they'd see me walking in. They'd say, hey, Riv. What's up, Riv? Well, <laughs> you know. And I, you know what I would say? How are you? I mean, it, it wasn't a big deal, you know. It wasn't a big deal. But if you're going to use the Bible... You've got to understand that a pastor, as defined here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, is a man. Can a woman be a children's minister, a youth minister, a small groups minister, a counseling minister, a women's minister, and on and on it goes? I would say absolutely yes. We have one here, in fact, in, in our congregation. But to use the term pastor confuses people. So what I think it's so important for you to see is that a pastor, an overseer, a bishop, a, 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 an elder is a man here in this verse. That now the overseer, verse 2, must be above reproach the husband of but one wife. Okay? So uh, I'm just going to you know, stop with that uh, for just a moment. And uh, I'm going to loop back to it, but uh, uh, for time's sake, I want to go to um, um, 1 Timothy chapter uh, 3 and verse 8. Where, okay, I'll come back to that if i got time. So if you look in 1 Timothy 3, you see that all of a sudden now he is picking up a different role, a different grouping. Verse 8. So he's talked in verses 1 through 7 about overseers, shepherds, pastors, elders. Okay, verse 8, deacons likewise are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. So again, you can see a deacon is a particular role within a church, and you can see it simply says, are men worthy of respect? Now, this is where it kind of, and I mean, I, I'm just all over the place, and I want to be very honest with you. I... One minute I'm here, and the other minute I'm here. I, th there are some things about the Bible that I just simply don't know. I just get confused, but the word confused is, is not really a good word. I am just open to the understanding that I may not fully understand. And this is one of those. Because it, it, it is a bit challenging for me. So it's obvious he's talking about deacons. What are deacons? Deacons are special servants in the church. They are special representatives of the church. As, as you leave this place and go out into this community, if you are a deacon, you are on mission. You are called upon by the leadership of this church to be a special representative for this church in a specific ministry, probably. Okay. Um, then we come to verse 11. Okay, And verse 11 says, In the same way, their wives are to be women worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. 
So the, 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 the big question here is, who are these women? It's obvious he's talking about women. He calls them their wives. But I guess the big question is, who is they're referring to? And here's the biggest problem. The word there, T-H-E-I-R, is not in Greek. So if you cover that up, it says, because the word there is just simply not there, okay? In the same way, wives, so who is that referring to? Well, it could refer to the wives of all of the above, right? And that seems to make sense. The wives of elders, the wives of deacons. The wives are supposed to be this way. But it also is extremely problematic because if it's referring to the wives of the people that he has just been talking about, deacons, why in the world does he give a description of deacons' wives but not elders' wives? Because an elder is of the higher calling. So it seems like an elder's wife ought to be of higher godliness than a deacon's wife. But he doesn't seem to give a description of elders' wives, but he does of deacons' wives, unless he is actually talking about a third group of special representatives of the church, and that would be wives or the word, you could probably have a footnote in your Bible or something, it could also be translated wives or women. It can, go, it can be either one just as well. Different translations deal with it in different ways. In the same way, women are to be uh, women worthy of respect. Not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. So here's the $64,000 question. Were there female deacons in the first century church? Well, many of you, I'm sure, are thinking right now about a passage over in the book of Romans. And uh, so let's jump there real quick. I think I have it for you. So in Romans chapter 16, we read about... Let me get over there with you. Romans 16 and verse 1. I commend you, our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Sincrea. Well, that term, uh, first of all, Phoebe is a sister. She's a woman. And that term servant is the Greek word for deacon, diakonos. Okay? And yes, it is masculine, but it is masculine because the feminine version didn't come along until some time later. But she is definitely called a special servant and here's the, th- here's the reason I believe that she was probably an official deacon of that church. Notice how he says, a, uh, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Sincrea. He is very specific. She's not just a servant. He talks about servants. We get about servants all through the Bible. He is identifying her as a servant in this church in Sincrea. So it seems to me that he is identifying her as a special representative or a special servant of the church. Then you come back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and the confusion, to me at least, is... If you're back there in 1 Timothy chapter 3, so he's talked about elders, he's talked about deacons, he's talked about females, women, wives, you know, you got to decide how to do it. But then in verse 12, he comes back and he talks about deacons some more. And that's very problematic for me, you know. Weren't you done talking about deacons in verse 8 through 10? Well, apparently not. He comes back and he talks about them some more in verse 12. Uh, and, and, and 13. So wh- who is this group here in verse 11 is the problem. Now, <laughs> what I'm simply saying to you is, makes me scratch my head because I just, I, I, I'm, sometimes I say it was, it seems definitely there's a third group of people and that is females who served as deacons. And then sometimes I come back and say, I'm not sure that this chapter supports that. So I don't know. 
So I'm going to tell you this twice today, and uh, the elders are going to love it. <laughs> and here's, here's, here's what I'm going to tell you. Passages like these are one of the reasons you have elders in a church. <laughs> okay? Because at the end of the day, we have to seek after their wisdom and their understanding of the Scriptures. And when they speak to us, even though I may not necessarily agree with their conclusion, I am under their authority as the shepherds of my soul, and I simply will submit to their understanding of the Scripture. Even though it may not be my specific understanding, I assume that they have thought this out well. And, and, and for what it's worth, they hadn't said this or that, okay? So it's, it's not like I'm about to unveil to you some great uh, uh, discovery here. I'm just saying passages like these that are open for a lot of discussion, and dare I use the word debate, are why you have elders in the church and why you have multiple elders in the church. You hear their wisdom, their teaching, their understanding, and you, you respond to it, okay? And I think that is so, so very important. Yes? I'm sorry, you're going to have to talk real loud. I said, I don't think it's a hill we want to die. Right. Okay, so that's one thing. The other thing is, if we look practically today at kind of the way the common good is, mm -hmm. we have really no freedom. Mm -hmm. Right? So we have what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's where I want to move to kind of start bringing some conclusion. And I think that's a, that's a, a good uh, observation. I know the folks at home didn't hear it, but I'm about to just simply repeat what, uh, what Todd has, has just said. So here's kind of the wrapping up of really six weeks of teaching on this. Okay? The elders and I met... Andrew, we met back in January, and we spent three hours one Saturday, three hours another Saturday. We tried to do our due diligence on this. And, and here's kind of some conclusions after all this study that we have found. That because of passages like the one we have in front of us, okay, and, and all the others... 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 14, Acts 18, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 3, bringing all of that together and acknowledging the tension of one passage saying women are praying and prophesying and the next passage saying they need to be quiet. <laughs> you know? And one passage saying that Priscilla and Aquila are teaching this man and the next passage saying a woman shouldn't teach this man. I mean, it, it, the first thing we had to do was acknowledge there is, it, it, you can't just find a verse and say, there it is, and so in case it's done. The Bible has a lot to say about this. The overarching, the overarching theme of Scripture from Genesis through Revelation about things like this is that there is a created order and we only as a society, but especially as a church, get in trouble when we ignore that created order. And that's what's happening all in the world. That's what's happening all in the world. We ignore the roles and the creative order that God put in place and we try to fight against it. We try to fight against it. Men, men should be able to have babies and they're going to be able to have babies and, and, and we do stuff like that. And it just only, and so the home, the family, everybody just, you know, there are no roles, uh, roles in, in family, and families fall apart, and society falls apart, and churches fall apart, okay? But one of our conclusions, based upon everything that I have taught you, everything that we have studied is, that there are two roles that it seems that Scripture identifies as male roles based upon, again, the created order. The first one is that of the elder, shepherd, pastor, <laughs> um, uh, bishop, 
overseer, if you package all that together the way the Bible does, not the way society does, but the way the Bible does, that seems to be a male role. Secondly, that the pastor-teacher from Ephesians chapter 4, the pastor-teacher, the teacher of the Word, the proclaimer of the Word, the, the one who presents the messages, the teaching from God's Word, is also a male, male role. Okay? So our basic conclusion is this. And do not read, do not go off, do, do not try to fig- say, oh, then that means, because you're going to be wrong if you do that. But our understanding is that the role of the elder is, since that's the word we basically use today, the role of the elder is a male role, and the role of the teacher of the people is a male role. I was very glad that we came to that conclusion, because my job was in jeopardy. But that's where we landed, and so we're good. (laughs) I'm just kidding. What that means, and you're always dangerous when you use broad terms, but what that means is that basically everything, and I'm going to put that word in quotes because somebody's going to catch me on it, everything else is open to anyone who has been gifted by God to be able to do that. Now, that has caused a lot of stir and consternation and problems within churches. But what what I've told you before, I maintain, most of these problems are our problems. The Bible did not... See, when the church met in the first century, there were no church buildings. And as bad as I hate to say it, there was no paid minister to stand before the people. The church was made up of the people, and in the church there were pastor-teachers, okay? Previous to that, there were apostles. Um, But now there are pastor-teachers, pastors and teachers, okay? So... When we built these buildings, all of a sudden, it changed the dynamic. If we were sitting in a circle in your living room, most of the things that we have a problem with in church would not be a problem because we're sitting in your living room. But because we have beautiful buildings like this with stairs, microphones, and a center podium, it creates a bit of a challenge for us. Who can stand up there? When can they stand up there? How can they stand up there? That was not even a question basically dealt with in the Scripture because it was not, a, it was not even a, a, a situation. The only situation that the Scripture really deals with is peace, harmony, order, and, and, and you know, making sure that, especially when outsiders come in, they are edified from what takes place. And when there's griping and bitterness and people being disruptive, that can't take place. So what does that mean about Vaughn Hill? Well, it means a little bit, but it doesn't mean as much as you think it probably means. So next Sunday, you're not going to see this, this, and this, and this, and this happening. We've created a monster. I remember when I was a youth minister... I remember there was, y'all remember when there used to be those boards up front and we'd put the attendance last week and the contribution and then over here there'd be a list of all the songs because the song leader was on the front row and he was trying to find songs and then somebody would go put the numbers up there. I remember when I was a youth minister, the song leader was running late or whatever, found the numbers and she said, I'll go put them up there. And she walked up there and she started sliding numbers. And you'd have thought that the, build, the roof of the building had blown off because she was taking over the authority of a male role. And I'm like, how, how did we get there? If, if, you know, back when we'd pick up attendance cards, you know, if, if a little girl would have picked up cards, oh, she's, she's participating and she is taking over. She's not in submission. She, And see, we've created this horrible dilemma for ourselves and boxed ourselves into a corner. And so we, you know, to come out of that is very difficult and very painful and and, and challenging. 
It just simply is. The truth is, as has been stated, that we sense that with the role of the overseer, the bishop, the pastor, the elder being a male role, the role of the teacher for the church being a male role, that there is freedom to do and experience and have other things. So we have had uh, females that stand on stage and, and, and help sing the female parts. We keep them in line. You can't, they can't sing bass, but they can sing soprano. Again, that's a joke. I'm sorry. But, you know, so they sing, and at times they've read a verse that, you know, they've had in front of them that they've maybe said, welcome, you know. And, and it, it, it's, it's been okay because this is why it's okay. Not because culture is pushing us to do that. Because we see in Scripture that it is okay. That, that, that God has ordained that we all have gifts and talents and, and whatnot. Okay? So, I guess, you know, I mean, there's so many things I've not talked about. There's so many things I've not talked about. Um, and, and you probably have a scripture in mind of something that maybe, you know, he didn't cover that. And you're right, I didn't, but it's not because I was running from it. It's just, I just don't have time to cover all these things. But here is the conclusion then. We all have been gifted by God. And our gift, remember, it's not for you, it's for the body. We all have these gifts. And we need to use our gifts. We need to use our gifts. And we need to continue to use our gifts in, in, in so many ways. When you talk to older women in the church, mature older women in the church, they see things a little bit different than maybe younger women in the church see those things. Okay? And that's okay. That's okay. The older women see there are, there's a hundred different things I can do to be involved in this church. That little hour thing they have there doesn't have to include me. You need to understand that's their perspective. The other side of that is, there are some younger women that say, I feel like I've been gifted to be able to sing. I'd like to sing. I've been gifted to be able to do this or do that, and I'd like to be able to do that in, in, in my church. And I think we've got to understand that as well. I, I guess to kind of just totally summarize, you've got five godly elders. You've got five godly elders who have to immerse themselves in this. This is just the tip of the iceberg, folks. You know how many other issues and problems and situations are out there that uh, we're, you know, they have to constantly uh, think about? And, and, and this is one of them. Have faith in your elders and just believe that they are godly men who are striving to make godly choices and decisions for you and for the person down the road from you. And the bottom line is, none of us get everything that we want. And it's probably a good thing. If this church was exactly the way Brian Magnuson wants it to be, it would probably not be nearly as good as it can be because you have gifts and talents and ideas that I don't have. And we bring those together to form the family, the family of God. And when we can do that, we're blessed. And when we can't, a group peels off and goes over there until they realize they don't totally agree, and then they peel off from there, and, and that's what happens. I think we can handle this because God has spoken and because we have godly leadership and because we have no axe to grind and no hidden agenda, we simply want to honor and worship God. Until He returns, we want to be the best we can be for this community. And so I think that's what the Scripture teaches. More than specific roles, godliness, humility, submission, helpfulness, worship. Those are the things that God cares most about. Well, as I tell you each week, I'm, I have nowhere to go. I hadn't had dinner yet, but I'll wait. Because I'm here and you can come up to me and you can ask me anything you want to ask me and I'll be more than happy to try to talk to you and, and help along the way. Um, I, I'm not going to be here next Wednesday, so we're kind of trying to decide exactly what we're going to do next Wednesday. But I can pretty much assure you it will not be a study of what we've been doing. And uh, I'll decide whether, you know, we'll talk to the elders and decide whether we want to continue any further with this 
but these are kind of the conclusions and where we have landed on these things. God bless you. Thank you for uh, being here. And uh, Harlan will have something good for you Sunday morning, I assure you.